covered up by mercy's hands A better view from where you stand The doorway to another land Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see all of you here tonight. Uh, we're going to get right under right, right underway because I have a lot for you. Violinist, would you please open the session with prayer? Brother, the floor is yours. Let's open the prayer. We're going to study tonight, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to gather and write your word and study it tonight, Father. Thanks for the people that have come tonight, and may we be richly blessed and as we gather around your word and really dig deep into see what it has to say and apply it to our lives. And, Us Romans, as he brings the other installment of the study to us tonight, help us to have receptive hearts and minds 
that will be able to soak up and process all of this knowledge that we're going to receive tonight. In Christ's name, amen. And amen. Thank you for that, Vio. Well, again, good to see you all here tonight. I just want to remind you, as I do every week, uh, that this is a discussion, not a lecture. Please feel free to, to submit, to type comments, insights, relevant, complimentary scriptures, and questions. But please hold those questions to the end because I am a sucker for rabbit trails. <clears throat> I think they're great. I think we could learn a lot from them. And there you can see my arrest photo right there of my rabbit trail occasions. So there's a, my full face and profile right there, courtesy of Vio. Having said all that, let us begin, shall we? We are continuing in our series, Spiritual Growth. This is part 18 of this ongoing series. As we have seen, the Word of God has much to say about our spiritual growth. I thought we would wrap it up last week, but here we are back again. As I write this, I can only say that when, say that when I have exhausted what is relevant and edifying to this theme, I will wrap up the series, but not one word before. <clears throat> Our first consideration to review and examine tonight is that spiritual growth involves prayer. But in the selected verse, Peter incorporates prayer as a summary statement, statement and a driving forth force to the behavioral changes that accompany our spiritual growth. So let's read his entire statement, <clears throat> and then the summary statement about prayer and how it in, it's involved in it. We read, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, Love as brethren, be pitiful, courteous, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrariwise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. <clears throat> for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. <clears throat> and so for people who do all the things that he said to do, and who put out of their lives all the things that he said to put out, when we pray, God is open, God's ears are open and to, to our prayers. And so it's all tied together as one package, so to speak. Now, of all of these points, Matthew Henry writes the following. The apostle here passes from special to more general exhortations. Number one, he teaches us how Christians and friends should treat one another. He advises Christians to be all of one mind, to be unanimous in the belief of the same faith, and the practice of the same duties of religion. And whereas the Christians at that time were many of them in a suffering condition, he charges them to have compassion one of another, 
and to love as brethren, to pity those who were in distress, and to be courteous to all. Hence, learn number one. Christians should endeavor to be all of one mind in the great points of faith. Let me stop right there. All of one mind in the great points of faith. There are a number of ways that, that Christians can understand and apply their Christianity, which God accepts, based on uh, physical maturity, spiritual maturity, cultural background, levels of understanding, and God still accepts those. Please read Romans 14 <clears throat> to see that when there is in those lesser points of understanding, that God accepts them all, and that we, having variations in worship style and understanding, should not condemn that brother who, who thinks differently about worshiping God. And again, <clears throat> we're talking about the great points of faith. To be more specific, the salvation level points of faith, that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, that he died for our sins, and that, he's, and that he was raised from the dead. I'm not going to say everything else is a minor point, but those are the major points that we should agree on. <clears throat> but there are many points that we should neither have to agree on or certainly should never divide on. So he says, learn, number one, that Christians should endeavor to all be of one mind in the great points of faith, in real affection, and in Christian practice. They should be like-minded one to another, according to Christ Jesus, Romans 15, 5, and not according to man's pleasure, but God's word. And Matthew Henry wrote this in 1711. It's just as relevant to the church as the day when he first shared it. And that's because, violinist and everyone, what he wrote about is timeless. No, there were no cell phones. There were no jet planes. There was no internet. There was no <clears throat> Google or, or, or even the, the, the dream of any of those things. And he likely wrote that by candlelight with a quill pen and a bottle of ink. It was published in 1711, so I'm sure he worked on it for years. But it is just as relevant to the church as the day when he first shared it. Because it is timeless. Scripture is timeless. <clears throat> Number two, though Christians cannot be exactly of the same mind, yet they should have compassion one for another and love as brethren. Whether or not we agree on those lesser points, we ought to love that person. We ought not to persecute or hate one another. Apparently, Matthew Henry was never part of a Christian group on Facebook <clears throat> to see what they do. It's a bloodbath in there. They are vicious. They ought not to persecute or hate one another, but love one another with more than common affection. They should love as brethren. And I'll add to that, as Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. What kind of love is that? It's selfless love. It's self-sacrificing love. <clears throat> Number three, Christianity requires pity to be distressed and civility to all. Pity to the distressed and civility to all. He must be a flagrant sinner or a vile apostate who is not a proper object of civil courtesy. There's something that's, that, that uh, Facebook and Twitter could use. Civil courtesy. 
and he says, see 1 Corinthians 15, or rather 5.11 and 2 John 1, 10 to 11 for those items. <clears throat> Number two, he instructs us how to behave toward enemies. The apostle knew that Christians would be hated and evil and treated of all men for Christ's sake, and therefore, number one, he warns them not to return evil for evil, nor railing for railing, but on the contrary, contrary, and Peter uses the word contrarywise, when they rail at you, do you bless them? When they give you evil words, do you give them good ones? <clears throat> Christ has both by his word and example called you to bless those that curse you from the Sermon on the Mount and has settled a blessing on you as your everlasting inheritance, though you were unworthy to bear evils patiently and to bless your enemies is the way to obtain this blessing of God and I submit is evidence <clears throat> of spiritual growth. Learn number one, to render evil for evil or railing for railing is a sinful, unchristian practice. The magistrate may punish evildoers, and private men may seek a legal remedy when they are wrong. But private revenge by dueling, scolding, or secret mischief is forbidden. And for this, see Proverbs 20.22, 20, Luke 6.27, Romans 12.17, and 1 Thessalonians 5.15. <clears throat> I mean, that admonition is repeated over and over because we need to hear it and read it over and over. I'll add to that now more than ever. To rail is to vile another in bitter, fierce, and reproachful terms. But for ministers to rebuke sharply and to preach earnestly against the sins of the times is not railing. That's not railing. <clears throat> All the prophets and apostles practice it. See Isaiah 56.10 and Zephaniah 3.3 and Acts 20.29. 20, Number two, the laws of Christ oblige us to return blessing for railing. Matthew 5.44 are words that Jesus spoke that I don't think no human being ever spoke before he said these words. Love your enemies. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those that hate you and pray for those that persecute you. It's not that we don't, it's not that we don't know what doing good is. It's that we don't want to apply that good to the people that curse us and hate us and persecute us. You must not justify them in their sin, but you must do for your enemies all that justice requires or charity, agape, godly love, commands. We must pity, pray for, and love those who rail at us. <clears throat> and violinist asks, how come we don't love our enemies then? Well, because we're not obeying what Jesus said to do. These are his commandments to his people, to those that believe in his name and have taken his name to themselves to be called Christians. But he asked even before he, you know, while he was still on the earth, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? He asked the same exact question. Number three, a Christian's calling, as it invests him with glorious privileges, so it obliges him to difficult duties. There's another answer right there, violinist. It's difficult to do that. And I will add that it is humanly impossible without God's indwelling Holy Spirit that enables us and empowers us 
to do the impossible. Number four, all the true servants of God shall infallibly inherit a blessing. They have it already in a great degree, but the full possession of it is reserved to another state and another world. <clears throat> Number two, he gives an excellent prescription for a comfortable, happy life in this quarrelsome, ill-natured world. Oh, Matthew Henry, if you only knew. And it's quoted from Psalm 34, verses 12 to 14. If you earnestly desire that your life should be long and your days peace, peaceable and prosperous, keep your tongue from reviling, evil speaking and slandering, and your lips from lying, deceit, and dissimulation. <coughs> Avoid doing any real damage or hurt to your neighbor, but be ever ready to do good and to overcome evil with good. Seek peace with all men and pursue it, though it retire from you. This will be the best way to dispose people to speak well of you and live peaceably with you. <clears throat> well, I couldn't agree more. He, violinist writes, if it was quarrelsome and ill-natured in 1711, it's much worse now. I disagree with your percentages, though. It's much worse than 100% worse. It just is. 854% is closer. Learn number one. Good people are under the Old and New Testament. Let me start again. Learn number one. Good people under the Old and New Testament were obliged to the same moral duties. To refrain the tongue from evil. The lips from guile was a duty in David's time as well as now. Number two, it's lawful to consider temporal or temporary advantages as motives and encouragements to religion. <clears throat> Number three, the practice of religion, particularly the right government of the tongue, is the best way to make this life comfortable and prosperous. A sincere, inoffensive, discreet tongue is a singular means to pass us peaceably and comfortably through the world. I lost my place in my notes. Give me a second, folks. <clears throat> okay, I got it. Must have tapped something on the page and it jumped. Number four, the avoiding of evil and doing of good is the way to contentment and happiness, both here and hereafter. Number five, it's the duty of Christians not only to embrace peace when it's offered, but to seek and pursue it when it is denied. Peace with societies as well as peace with particular persons, in opposition to division and contention, is what is here intended. <clears throat> Number three, he shows that Christians need not fear that such patient, inoffensive behavior as is prescribed will invite and encourage the cruelty of their enemies, for God will thereby be engaged on their side. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, in 1 Peter 3.12. And he takes special notice of them, exercises a provident, providential constant government over them, and bears a special respect and affection to them.
his ears are open to their prayers. So that, so that if any injuries be offered to them, they have this remedy. They may complain of it to their Heavenly Father, whose ears are always attentive to the prayers of his servants in their distresses, and who will certainly aid them against their unrighteous enemies. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. <clears throat> Observe number one, we must not in all cases adhere to the express words of Scripture, but study the sense and meaning of them, otherwise we shall be led into blasphemous errors and absurdities. We must not imagine that God hath eyes and ears and face, though these are the express words of the Scripture. <clears throat> and I think we can apply the term anthropomorphism to God having eyes and ears and so on. We, we apply these terms because we understand them on a human level and convey the idea that God is watching us and hearing us. But we're dealing with an eternal being who inhabits eternity, if we can fathom that. And so the eyes of eyes and ears of God are, in any, if anything, very limiting to all that He is. <clears throat> Number two, God hath a special care and paternal or fatherly affection toward all His righteous people. Number three, God doth always hear the prayers of the faithful. See John four thirty one, First John five fourteen, and Hebrews four sixteen. Our invitation to have intimate and even bold communication with God. Okay, that was an end of quotation. Uh, Hebrews 4.16 was the end of quotation to Matthew Henry. These are my words introducing the next <clears throat> uh, idea in this series. Our invitation to have intimate and even bold communication with God via prayer contributes greatly to our spiritual growth. Access to the very throne of God is made available to us through Christ. We read, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. <clears throat> And the writer of Hebrews continues, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore, with all that in mind, therefore, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help, in time of need, from Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, the verse that Matthew Henry ended off with <clears throat> in his thoughts. And of this, Alexander McLaren writes, Throne of Grace. In the context are three great exhortations which bear a very remarkable and distinct relation to each other. Let us labor to enter into rest. Let us hold fast our profession. And let us come boldly to the throne of grace. And the violinist took the words right out of my mouth. I love Alexander McLaren's insights. I mean, really, violinist, everybody, what's not to love? It's a hard thing to labor to enter into rest. How is it to be done? The second exhortation helps us to answer, let's hold fast our profession. 
which being translated into other words is this. Our true way of labor is to cling in faith to him whom we acknowledge. <clears throat> but knowing the weakness of our hearts and how they waywardly fluctuate and pass from the one confidence and, and happiest trust, I, okay, waywardly fluctuate and pass away from the one confidence and happiest trust, it is with profound wisdom that the ultimate injunction is held out for the foundation of all. Let us come. <clears throat> okay, that was an incomplete sentence, which I inadvertently cut off before it was finished. And it should have been, let us come to the throne of grace. There we get the strength that will enable our slack and be numbed fingers to grasp again the things we hold. <clears throat> There we, sh there we shall get that fresh grip of Christ which will quicken us or enliven us for the labor of entering into rest. And so this por portion of exhortation interposed between the doctrinal and theological parts of this letter is addressed to everyone in the Christian profession. <clears throat> I ask you then, look at this exhortation, which covers the whole ground of Christian duty and strength. Now, first, here is a very remarkable and beautiful expression, the throne of grace. Grace, of course, as I do not need to explain, is the New Testament word for the undeserved favor and loving regard of God to man, considered as weak, sinful, and unworthy. It is love which has its own motive apart from any regard to worthiness and the object upon which it falls. <clears throat> and so we are unworthy recipients of God's grace. We receive it because, because he loves us. We're his creatures. Our belief in Jesus Christ makes us his children. Grace is its own real impulse and motive. And grace is said in Scripture as the opposite of desert. We don't deserve it. <clears throat> and it is of grace, not of works, and so forth. It is the antagonist of sin and unrighteousness and all evil, and so runs up to the idea that it expresses the unmerited, self-oriented, loving regard of God to us poor, miserable creatures who, if dealt with on the ground of right and retribution, would receive something very different indeed. But my text says the throne of grace is the throne of God. I wonder if it's too picturesque to take that word of grace here as a kind of synonym of God. Think of the figure that was in the writer's mind as being that grace itself was the, was the occupant <clears throat> of the throne. That there, that there she sits, regal, sovereign, and thrown in the heart of the universe, queen of all things, and given from her full and generous hand to every creature, all that, all that which the creature requires. And here his use of the feminine pro pronoun, she, he's, he's speaking of grace. Grace as sitting on a throne. <clears throat> Changing the gender reference to God. He just, just called him a father. He said that he had a paternal love for us. Then if we take the more prosaic notion, which perhaps is the safer one, and think that the metaphor is not that grace is queen and sovereign, but only that the throne is based and established, as it were, in grace, <clears throat> out of which this undeserved love flows in broad, 
full streams. Even if we take the metaphor thus, we come to the same thought that whatever else there may he in the divine nature, the ruling sovereign element in deity is unmerited love and mercy and kindly regard to us poor, ignorant, and sinful creatures, which keeps pouring itself out over all the world. God is king, and the kingly thing in God is infinite grace. <clears throat> then we can scarcely but bring into connection with this grand idea the other phrases which the Old Testament gives to the same thought. Read such words as these. Justice and judgment are the habitation of his throne. God sitteth on the throne of his holiness, the throne of thy glory. <clears throat> yes, the throne of justice and of judgment white and sparkling, cold and repellent, the throne of glory, flashing and dazzling, coruscating and blinding, glittering and shimmering, ready to smite the, the diseased eye, <clears throat> the throne of holiness, yes, lofty, far up there, towering above us in its pure completeness. And we poor creatures, being ourselves blinded and dazed and far away from him, down amidst the lowlands and materialites, and all that majesty in the heavens, the justice and judgment, the holiness and glory, all that is only the envelope and wrappage. <clears throat> the living center and heart of it is a pure, lambent glow of tenderness. And the throne is truly the throne of grace. <clears throat> throne gives us all ideas of majesty, sovereignty, dominion, infin infinitude, and greatness. The thought that it is the throne of grace sheathes all these in the softest, tenderest, most blessed folds of love unmerited, free, spontaneous, simply because he is God and not, a call, and not on account of any goodness in us. <clears throat> Bearing in mind this great conception of true love, ruling dominant, sovereign element in the divine nature, let us ask, how do we reach it? Are we warranted in believing it? Read the verse that come before. For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. <clears throat> Turn that doctrinal statement into a statement of principle, and it just comes to this, that our certitude that God's throne is a throne of love and grace is all involved in, dependent upon, and built upon the work of Christ, the high priest of our profession. Now that's to say, not thank God that his work makes God's throne a throne of grace, that's not the teaching of the scripture, but that he as high priest and therefore as the revealer to us of God as he is, shows us in his life and death <clears throat> in the gentleness of his character and the tenderness of his compassion in the depth of his sympathy on earth and the tenderness that touched the little children and their innocence 
and the harlots in their filth, and in the death that he died upon the cross for the sake of the world, the very heart of God is cut open, as it were. And the two halves fall apart as when we cut some rich fruit to lay hair the to lay hair the inmost pulp. And I'm sure that should be lay bare the inmost pulp. That's a typo that was in <clears throat> what I cut and pasted, so I'll fix that in my notes. God has manifested to us. God dis declares himself to us in the sympathy of, of the humanity and the life and the death upon the cross. And the priest, in his sacrifice and by his sacrifice, shows us that between the cherubim throned above the mercy seat shimmers the Shekinah of power with its white center of love and peace. And then on the other side, that same great thought of the priesthood of Christ influences this conception of the throne of God in another fashion still. <clears throat> or, as it seems to me, there is no understanding of the depth and meaning of the work of Jesus Christ our Lord unless we heartily accept this, that his great sacrifice for us, in which mainly he is the high priest of our profession, is the means and channel and medium and condition through which all the love of God expresses itself to the world and has communicated to sinful man all his goodness and all his pity and tenderness, supplying all our necessities, and is all through and is all things to us through Christ our Lord. <clears throat> that is a mouthful, but it is so powerful. Seen through him. Jesus Christ. The throne is white with tenderness. Flowing through him from the throne proceeds the river of the water of life. And so in both ways the throne of grace is such by reason of the priesthood of Christ. Look for a moment in the next place at the temper and disposition with which we come to this throne. Let us come boldly now, boldly is a somewhat incongruous word. <clears throat> it neither conveys the original, nor does it correspond to our sense of propriety. The thought would be far more beautiful and far more naturally represented by a more literal translation. Let us come with frank confidence to the throne of grace. The word literally means, if we go to the etymology of it, speaking everything. <clears throat> you can easily understand how naturally that becomes an expression for the unembarrassed, unrestrained, full outpouring of a heart. You cannot pour out your heart in the fullest confidence to a person that you don't respect. But if you get with someone you entirely trust, how swiftly the words flow, and how very easy it is to tell, to tell out the whole heart. <clears throat> Thus, so with this great word of the writer of the epistle, descriptive of the temper and disposition with which men, are, men and women are to go to God, with confidence, full, cheerful, unembarrassed, and which expresses itself in full trust 
exactly, exactly as one of the old Psalms say. <clears throat> Ye people, pour out your heart before him. Yes, let it all flow out, just as you would do to husband or wife or lover or friend or the chosen companion to whom we can tell everything. <clears throat> Oh, but there is no such person. There is nobody, not a soul, could stand the turning inside out of a man. There's no one able to do it to another, even supposing the other could bear it. But my text says, come, and is so gentle in its love, so strong in its grace, sweetly wooing us, to the freest and frankest outpouring of all of our hearts before the throne. <clears throat> we can and are invited to talk to God as we can only talk to God and cannot talk to anyone else. <clears throat> Let us then come with confidence because Jesus' work as our high priest is in the writer's mind. You remember the vision in the Revelation where the seer <clears throat> beholds the angel coming with a censer, and he takes incense from off the golden altar. And he goes on to say that this much incense was offered in the censer with prayers of saints. That is a picturesque and graphic representation of this same idea. My poor cry, the devotions of my trembling, unfaithful heart, the halting, limping approach of my sluggish spirit, these go along with and are offered through that great high priest. <clears throat> Let the much incense of thy prayer on my behalf ascend. Truly we have a loving high priest. Let us therefore, because we do, come boldly or come confidently to the throne of grace. Let us not use as a mere empty form those words for Christ's sake, but let us remember that these words do hold the very secret of all acceptable approach to God, and that no man cometh to the Father but by me. There is reason enough, God knows, in your heart and mind and in our poor, miserable, wretched, conventional, conventional, formal chatterings called prayers for diffidence and distrust. <clears throat> Well then, let us fully look that fact in the face, entertain untremblingly the fullest consciousness of the insufficiency un and unworthiness of all we do and all we are and all we feel and all we seek, and then wrenching ourselves away, as it were, from the contemplation of our own selves only land us in diffidence or self-doubt and despair, let us turn to him that we may have boldness and confidence in our access to the feet of him who is our great high priest, passed into the heavens and who now sits on the throne of grace. <clears throat> Now, lastly, a word about the issue and the result of this confidence of access to the throne of grace, the throne of spontaneous love. That we may obtain mercy, says the writer. 
and find grace to help in time of need. It is noteworthy, I think, to consider that the writer here is evidently thinking not about a communion with God which is not prayer, but a communion with God which on our side is the lifting up of an empty hand, and on his side the bestowing a large, full gift. There is no fellowship possible with there is no fellowship with God possible on the footing of what people call disinterested communion. No, we have to always go to him to get something from him. The question is what do we expect to get? My text tells us not the temporal or temporary blessings, not the answer to foolish desires, not the taking away of thorns in the flesh, but mercy and grace to help, inward and spiritual blessings. But what are these? <clears throat> well, I don't know whether it's too nice or too microscopic criticism to say that I seem to see a difference between obtaining mercy and finding grace. I take it grace is used in what is called a secondary sense, not meaning so much the love of God unmerited, but rather signifying the consequences of that love and the gifts bestowed upon us. And you know that's a usage of the, co of the word common in the New Testament, thus making the word into a plural graces, manifold gifts that, be that love bestows upon us. <clears throat> but I take it this word is here used in the secondary sense and if that be so we may shape a difference between the two phrases obtaining mercy and finding grace I do not think I can put that better than by using a metaphor the one expresses the heart of God the other expresses the hand of God. <clears throat> you may obtain mercy as a suppliant coming, coming boldly and confidently and frankly with faith in the great high priest to the throne of grace. There we get the full heart of God. I stand before him in my faith my weakness, with conscience gnawing at me in the sense of my many infirmities, many a sin and shortcoming and omission, and on the throne, if I may say so, is a shoot of tender love from God's heart to me. <clears throat> and I get for all my weakness and sin, pity and pardon, and find mercy of the Lord in that day. Okay, Trinity, thank you for coming. I guess she's already gone. <clears throat> I find mercy of the Lord in that day. Then in getting the full heart of God with all his divine abundance and pardoning grace and tender gracious pity, I get, of course, the full hand of God to obtain mercy and find grace. The bestowment of the needful blessings, the obtaining of grace in time of need, the right grace, no blunders in the equipment with which he supplies us. <clears throat> he does not give me that parcel that was meant for you, there is no error in the delivery. He does not send his soldiers to the North Pole equipped for warfare in Africa. He doesn't give this man's blessing that the man's circumstances would not require. 
No, no. Blessed be God. He cannot err. We fall back upon the words that precede my text, and there is no creature concealed from his sight. For all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. <clears throat> That may be and is terrible unless we take it along with the other word that we have not a high priest who cannot sympathize with, sympathize with our weakness. We see a divine omniscience or all-knowingness shining upon us through the merits of the great high priest, full of life and hope and because all things are naked and open to the eyes of him who is our high priest. <clears throat> Therefore the right grace will be most surely given to me to help me in the time of need, or as the words may be may perhaps be more vigorously and correctly translated, find grace for timely aid. Grace punctually and precisely at the very nick of time at the very exact time determined by heaven's chronometer, <clears throat> and not by ours. It will not come as quickly as impatience might think it ought. It will not come so soon as to prevent any agony of prayer. It will not come in time enough for our impatience, for murmuring, for presumptuous desires, but it will come in time to do all that is needed. Ah, and it will come before Peter has gone below the water, though not until Peter has felt the cold waves rise to his knees and has cried out, Lord, save me, I perish. <clears throat> Master, he whom thou lovest is sick. And he abode still two days in the same place where he was. And when he came, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Said I not unto thee that if thou didst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. The Lord shall help her and that right early. Oh, my friends, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace for every time, <clears throat> for every time of need. Unquote from Alexander McLaren. There is more to share with you on the subject of spiritual growth. God willing, I will bring, as that should read, bring that more with you, same time and place next week, and I invite all of you who are hearing or reading these words to join me then. And for those of you who are pretty sure I was just about to say it, and you would be correct, this concludes this evening's discussion, Spiritual Growth, Part 18. I do greatly appreciate your <clears throat> attendance here tonight. I hope I made it worth your car fare, and I mean that sincerely. But, ladies and gentlemen, we are not quite finished yet, violinist. Would you please close this session with a piece or two? On your violin. The floor is yours, brother. Okay. Let's get my microphone angled up here. Oh, baby. Oh, baby.
they have the name of light. Oh yeah, you need lights. Thank you. 